have the honor and the pleasure of being with uh, Dr. Milan Ruksic, who um, is at Northwestern University. He'll describe his, uh, his, his title, but he is one of the, the leading experts in nanotechnology. And uh, Northwestern University and our Illinois Science and Technology Park are really hubs for nanotechnology in the, in the country. Uh, and there's a lot of exciting developments and, and possibilities for the future. So I wanted to ask you about, I, I know that you focus most on health and biotechnology. What are the kinds of advancements that we could see in the next five or ten years? Well, first, thank you, Congresswoman. It's always nice to see you and, uh, and you. to meet today. Uh, nanotechnology really gives us a new way of doing many of the things we've done in the past. So in terms of drugs, as we develop drugs, one of the challenges is that we can develop a drug that is quite effective in principle, but when we take it, it doesn't get to the right tissue. It gets cleared too rapidly. Like what? Uh, for example, blood thinning drugs. Blood thinning drugs are very difficult to dose because we metabolize them at different rates. And so one dose in me may get cleared too quickly and not have an effect, but in another individual, it may stay around too long and lead to leaky vessels with other problems. And so a big other challenge is getting drugs to the brain. Mm. The brain is protected by something called the blood-brain barrier, and many drugs simply don't pass through that barrier. So it remains difficult without surgery to get drugs into the brain where they can repair uh, processes that might lead to Parkinson's and other neurological disorders. With nanotechnology, we now know that tiny particles, nanoparticles, that are thousands of times smaller than the width of a hair, they're able to pass through that blood-brain barrier quite effectively. So we might be looking in how near term um, new therapies for perhaps Parkinson's disease, is Alzheimer's on the list as well? Indeed. So with Parkinson's there are drugs that have efficacy, they work with Alzheimer's, we're still uh, not at the point of having good drugs, we're on the way. But why this is so exciting is if a pharmaceutical company has invested half a billion dollars to develop a drug, they have a valuable uh, product there. But if they can't get it to the site where it acts, they can't bring it to market. Nano could be the technology that takes their investment and makes it successful by letting them deliver that drug to the brain. And, and, and speaking of the kind of investments, you're, you've been involved in some companies that have actually become commercialized. Um, I wondered what those are, and also the difficulty, if there is one, of transitioning from the research and development into the actual commercialization of these wonderful new products. Well, one of the exciting things about nanotechnology uh, is that much of what we all work on uh, is so closely related to an application, so that if we do discover something new that's useful, there is a route to getting it uh, going towards the marketplace. In our case, we developed a a technology for testing drugs very rapidly. So when a new disease is taken up by the pharmaceutical industry, it usually starts by uh, running three million tests. They have a collection of three million small molecules, and they just one by one test each of those in a, in a miniaturized lab test to see which ones are active. And those become the lead compounds, the starting points. In some diseases, it's straightforward to do those tests as straightforward as three million operations can yeah. be, but in others it's a in, lot. It's a lot. In others, it's really challenging, and we've developed something called a label-free technology, a way of seeing an active compound no matter what the uh, no matter what it does, and we commercialize that. Interestingly, that's technology that we developed in the university, and then a small business grant, an SBIR grant from the NSF, mm -hmm. allowed us to hire the first two people. A rent space in the technology incubator, mm -hmm. and within a year we were profitable because there was a real market need and the technology was ready to go. So you say a, a grant from the National Science Foundation, so the federal government has been a partner in helping to make this commercialized and available. Absolutely, and I think in that first phase of, of taking a university discovery and getting it out of the university into a small business, that's very challenging. And it's particularly challenging for professors who haven't done it before. Mm -hmm. And this is where the federal uh, programs, these SBIR grants, can make a world of difference. And they did in this one company that, uh, that came out of my lab. 
One of the things that I just uh, heard loud and clear at the hearing at which you testified is that in order for the United States to be able to compete in the global nanotechnology field, that we're going to need both private and public um, greater, greater investment. We, bet we were hearing about a, a brain drain, we were hearing about um, China and other countries making greater investments. Are we, um, what can we do to make sure that the United States of America continues to be in the lead and that we actually make the stuff here, the, whatever products are in, in energy, in uh, biotechnology, that we make it here in America? It's an important uh... It's an important challenge because the world for us has changed in the past decade. Before the last decade, it, we saw the best scientists from Asia, from Europe, from all parts of the world having their dream of coming to the United States to do their PhD work, to work, to start their businesses, and to really invent and develop products. Now, with the increased uh, uh, government support of nanotechnology in Europe, in Asia, particularly in China, we're seeing the best students re remaining home, that is the foreign students not coming, but more than that for the first time, we're seeing American researchers and professors moving to other regions to take on full-time positions, and that's driven by uh, much more generous funding for the research programs. I think parallel with that, and it's related, we're seeing much more investment by both the private uh, industries in those regions and the governments in the commercialization phase of research and development. So we've seen companies in the United States get bought by, uh, by partnerships in Asia, battery companies, for example, mm -hmm. and we're going to continue seeing that, and the only way to address it is to make sure that the opportunities for the best scientists and engineers uh, are here in America. There's even an uh, immigration-related issue attached to, to that that is preventing us from taking advantage of the best minds in the world. Have you seen that at Northwestern? We've seen it. I've seen it at Northwestern and in uh, companies uh, which I'm involved in, but also companies that come to me and ask whether there are students graduating my, uh, from my group that are ready to go to work. And many of these companies ask specifically that the people I recommend be American citizens because if they were to try to hire a foreign student, they have to go through a very laborious and lengthy and uncertain process to get them a green card. So what we have are students who come to the United States to do their PhD. We invest about $300,000 in that student in the course of their PhD. If you add up the laboratory, the support we give them, the tuition payments, and after that enormous investment to train somebody who is a world's expert in their technical field, we make it extremely challenging for them to take a job here in the United States. That's a system that doesn't work. I think there's, and I was glad to hear your comments about this earlier and the recognition that this needs to be changed, but it's been apparently challenging to change. Well, I hope that we're able to pass comprehensive immigration reform and make sure that these um, students that come to the United States, get educated here, want to stay here and develop new products and, and do, new, do more research, are, are allowed to stay and that we be, remain an attractive place for the best minds in the, in the world. One more question. Um, you uh, had talked about the National Nanotechnology Institute, which unfortunately right now has not been reauthorized. Um, and, and what is that and why is that important for us to maintain? So this is important. The NNI was created in 2000 and it was really created at a time when it was becoming apparent that nanotechnology was a new technology that could change the ways we create devices and products in all fields from energy to electronics to biology and medicine. But the existing funding agencies uh, weren't versed in nanotechnology, and they're large, and it takes some time for them to evolve. So the NNI required each of the agencies to direct a fraction of their, of their budgets to nanoscale science and engineering research. And over the space of uh, 10 years, it really then built the infrastructure. It really gave us the labs, the tools, the equipment, and the students with training to work in this area. So in that space of 10 years, which is pretty short, uh, the United States emerged as the global leader in nanoscience
science and nanotechnology. Uh, that money uh, has, in some sense, run out. That is, as you say, the NNI hasn't been formally renewed in any way. And I think we're at a stage where, with this incredible investment that we've made in nano, and it's paid off, we've become the global leader. Uh, but now we see that if we don't keep the investment going, other countries will compete and will start to compete effectively. So what's needed is a renewed investment to basic fundamental research, uh, some attention that gives uh, more efficient ways of getting university discoveries into small companies and large companies so that they can march towards product development. And again, I was very pleased to hear your comments on this topic because it really is an important one and one that we've invested so much already. It would just be a crime if we didn't continue and realize uh, what will be a really significant economic area for us. Well, I am really proud to represent Northwestern University, and I know that Northwestern has been a leader in the whole development of the field of nanotechnology. I certainly want to see that continue, um, both uh, parochially here in our, in our community, but of course we want the United States to continue to be the innovator and the leader in this promising field, as you said, in so many, so many different ways, including um, the, the health of our, of our country and the world. So thank you so much for what you do. Well, thank you. And for talking with me. Thanks for having me on, and thanks so much for all the support that you provided Got it. and for everything you've helped us do at Northwestern, becoming really a global leader in nanoscience. Thank you. Thank you.